and right now I run a lab in the Midwest and I'm using a short path distiller. So that kind of sums up the background and experience there. Awesome. And today we're talking about like finding, optimizing and, and choosing settings for your short path. So I know start us with like, what, what are the few, like the most important things to get your short path running and then we'll go into like the optimization details and try to answer any questions that you guys post. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so how would I approach, you know, coming to the right conditions or the right settings? I think it's really important uh, before you deep dive into, hey, these are my ideal parameters. I think one of the most important things you really got to focus on is finding out what your baseline vacuum pressure is for your specific setup. So, you know, the differences between like somebody who buys like your six inch wipe film, you have a standardized baseline vacuum pressure, you know what that system's baseline vacuum pressure is. But when you're putting together a short path, which is basically a bunch of different components, most of the time, you might have a, a different size pump than somebody else has. And so your baseline vacuum pressure could be different. But one of the most important things you can do for yourself is right when you get your short path, the very first thing you want to do, or really any distillation system, right, is before you put oil into it, pull it under vacuum and take note of what your baseline vacuum pressure is. And what we mean by baseline vacuum pressure is what vacuum pressure can your system reach all on its own with nothing else in it, knowing that it's perfectly sealed and connected correctly, right? So- Oh, like the clean and dry, right? Yes. Like there's no, it, and like even on the white film, it's super important because you, you cleaned it, there's my residual stuff that you might've developed leak somewhere and on short path where you're disassembling it every time, it's even more important, I imagine. Correct, and you know, I've done lots and lots of troubleshooting over the years, and that's one of the things, um, just to kind of toss out there, I have a YouTube channel, you guys can find me on YouTube at Launchpad Chemistry, so just search YouTube for that, you'll find me. Um, and to out on that plug, great, very detailed videos, like truly amazing. Thank you, so we're, we're, I'm actually working on a new chapter of that series where it's focusing on all troubleshooting, and one of those troubleshooting things that I reiterate over and over in this series is, hey, before you start distilling, pull vacuum, write it down. So, you know, to kind of iterate what I would do is, you know, I have two vacuum gauges. I have one vacuum gauge at the head of the pump. And then uh, typically another vacuum gauge right off the end of the first cold trap. You could have that vacuum gauge elsewhere if you wanted it, like before the cold trap, if you want to know what that pressure is over there. But I usually find right off the cold trap is a great place to have one. That way you know if you're overloading your condensers or not. And then have one right at the pump, the pump head so that when you set up your system, you just pull down on the pump and you go, hey, I'm pulling to... 12 micron, let's just say like average for a 14 or 16 CFM vacuum pump. Hey, I'm pulling to 12 micron. I'm gonna write that down. I'm gonna note that. And now I'm gonna open the system up to pressure and I'm gonna write down the number that that achieves. You know, maybe that's brand new. You should probably be getting about the same as the pump head, brand new out of the box. So, you know, we'll say 12 to 20 micron across the whole system, write that down and then start chilling your cold traps down and then write that, that number down. And so if everything's hooked up correctly, what you should see is the moment you start adding dry ice to that alcohol that's in your cold trap or um, within at least 30 minutes to an hour of turning on your um, immersion probe or your cold finger, you should start to see that vacuum uh, you know, slowly start plummeting, right? Because th those take more time to chill down versus just, hey, I'm going to toss some dry ice in here and it's going to happen within minutes, right? That's super powerful. Yeah. yeah. So dry ice can solve a lot of problems, which, you know, I think we can talk about later in this um, stream here. So now getting back to ideal conditions, right? Like now that I know I have ideal vacuum, the next set of questions of like, what am I trying to get to? Is it color? Is it potency? Do, does my business, my lab business, does it care more about speed of throughput 
does it care more about, you know, high purity? Are you trying to go for 92, 95, 99%? Um, or, you know, and then a whole nother bubble is like, are you trying to distill terpenes carefully? Are you trying to fraction off some really good, um, you know, aromatics before you get into that activation, decarboxylation, high heat, because we all know that the terpenes that come off of, you know, decarb yeah. and the terpenes that come off after, you will say, you know, 130 to 150 C, they don't smell that great anymore, do they? No, no, they smell like feet and fish. Yeah, feet, dumpster fires, you know, I've heard all sorts of fun uh, uh, explanations of what people think. You have to choose what is optimum. Like, what's your goal? Like, is you can't just be like, oh, magic numbers. Like, you no, know, there's the like, it's well, uh, the the dichotomy I always use is on white film. It, it's speed versus quality versus yield. Yes. Right. And you, it's actually totally possible to get high speed and high quality. It's just your yield's gonna suffer. Yep. Yep. And so you know, in a really elaborate setup. You know, we can touch on this a little early, but in a really elaborate setup, you would have a white film and a short path because a white film can't do what a short path can do. And a short path definitely can't do what a white film can do when it comes to pure volume of distillation. So, you know, what I like to well, do. But, uh, what can a short path do that a white film can? So, inherently a short path in my experience is better at holding down heavy pigments for color so i find that i always get a better color without sacrificing as much of the yield on the heavy residue side on a short path compared to a white film and so, you know, and I said that the best is having them both in, in my ideal setup, I have a white film doing um, strip and first pass. And then I only use the short path <clears throat> for a second pass. And oh, for the squeeze? Or like like when, when you, you take the residue from that first pass and, and, you, and you distill that? No, is that what you're doing? No, on the, okay. No, so, so I do have, you know, high yield white film distillation okay. so high temperature make sure that residue is thick and obsidian like and you know that you rang that whole rag out right? right that residue is hard as a rock there's no thc left in it or no cannabinoids left in it and so you know that your distillate is all the cannabinoids now typically we know that when we run white film at that higher temperature setting you're going to get excellent yield but the color is almost always in the um, darker yellow spectrum. Right. It, 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 in the cartridge, right? In the bulk jar, it's kind of hard to tell all the time, you know, what that clarity is. You know, might, they might both be orange in the bulk jar, but when you thin them out and you do put them into a, both into a test car, you might see, hey, this one's yellow. This one's kind of like off light clear. And so, what I like to do is I run the first pass strip through the wiper. Second, second actual pass is, you know, your, what we call our first pass, right? So it's distillate, high yield, throw away that residue because it's done. Now I take that distillate and that's when I put it into the short path because I can now boil off everything except for those heavy pigments. And you can really turn that dial as specifically as you'd like. If you want to get near water clear distillate, you can do that. You'll end up sacrificing more and more yield. The more picky you are about color, which then that kind of translates back to white film, right? right. Like you really want to care about color on a white film, you're going to lose some of that yield um, to your residue. Right. But I find that there is there's a, like another optimum that most people do like that one pass of the white film because it it's a lot of extra steps to do the alternative, which is if you want to go max yield on a white film, you actually run fast yeah. and leave most like half the cannabinoids behind in the residue and you'll get great color. Maybe not Ex quite excellent color. So on the short path, 
but now you have to rerun your residue again. Yeah, so in, in this way, you don't have to actually redun, rerun any residue. You can just reject it, and you just take that nice first pass distillate from the white film, put it into the short path, and just boil it until you start seeing color coming out your sidearm. And if you're fortunate enough, like me, to have a beaker and wrench outlet pump on your short path, it just gets even easier to perfectly say, hey, I see pigments coming over, stop pumping out. You're not gonna contaminate my flask with darker color. And then what's great about that is I then have this beautiful flask of perfect mains. And anything that's just a little too dark, well, we know that we can just use that for edibles, for tinctures, for other products, right? So um, how I run the short path and, and white film is really more about color in the final product while also relating to obviously potency and needing to accommodate some kind of throughput. So I find that the short path just cranks when you only put second pass or sorry, first pass into it and you're only performing a second pass. If you don't got to mess with any heavy residue, the boiling pot is just whoo, a breeze to clean. It's so simple to maintain. You almost never have any vacuum issues to mess with. And if you do, you just know right away, it's not solvent because it can't be. It's not decarboxylation because it can't be it's not you know what i mean you start going through this checklist of the things that just can't be so then vacuum troubleshooting when you're only running um or when you're only doing a second pass distillation is relatively easy you go up oh, it's the pump or it's my cold traps because i'm overloading my condensers you know it's almost always one of those two things um if you weren't kind of knuckleheaded and connected something wrong right totally and like, sorry. Um, oh yeah, like that, that told me like the, the 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 narrower the cut, it's totally true on white film too. The faster you can run, and the the more precise that cut's gonna be. And if you make it a wide cut, like you you can do that with a white pound film or a short path. But if you do that narrow cut, you're gonna run at least that cut. You you're gonna have more steps, but you'll get that cut uh, really fast. And yeah. It's optimal. And and, and you know, the, the kind of takeaway there is like, if you only have a six inch wiper, you can do it. And at the end of the day, you're probably going to be about the same speed as if you took that distillate and then ran it through a short path, right? Because you're really only going to get, you know, at most a liter or so out an hour when, you know, the white film can hit, you know, five to seven reliably right so if you only have one thing you know if you only have a white film you can definitely tune it to do that um, but if you got the real estate space and the power availability um, it's just nice to take advantage of both um, kinds of distillations because again they're mechanically while they're both distillations they're just mechanically very different types of distillations time separation one's a continuous like it's all mixed together. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, like the way I kind of explain it often is, do you have a question? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, so, so the, the way I, that's, that's right. So oh. the way I kind of explain that often. There's in stuff. Like how do you like, like pick a goal in mind? Like how do you set up a parameter for that? Okay, so um, I mean, I can just use um, you know, how I kind of run my system every single day and how I tuned my system for what I was trying to do. So again, I was more focused on color um, while potency was obviously important as well. Um, so, you know, got to make sure you're doing really good winterization. So your crude is um, very high potency to begin with. That makes the distillation very easy. But so how I kind of approach temperatures is I know just from all the years of doing it that um, under extreme vacuum, cannabinoids really want to start boiling at around 155, 165 C, right? That's a safe setting for really deep vacuum on a white film. We know that if you have a wide enough bore on your short path with a short enough distance to the condenser, you're going to start seeing, you know, cannabinoids boil over in that kind of upper 150s, low 160 range. 
So knowing that, that's the best place to start to figure out, you know, where your actual distillation temperatures are going to be for your, um, for your exact setup. And start there and just keep slowly increasing your boiling pot temperature and very importantly, slowly keep increasing the rotation of the magnetic stir bar because yes, you have heat and vacuum boiling those things up, but you really need the agitation to help spread all that oil all around the mantle, all around the boiling pot. So it's all getting nice and evenly hot. And then you know that as many vapors as can possibly fit or the analogy I use is it's like a bunch of cars trying to cross the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, they're all just gonna get in line and go up and over based upon how heavy the car is. You know, that's basically distillation. The, the heavier the molecule is, the higher the boiling point means the longer it's gonna take and the more energy you need to send it up and the over. So. The get out of the traffic jam first and then the trucks come out last. Yes, exactly. So I always start at this upper 150s, lower 160s. And it a very hard thing to just tell people what rotation to use is like, there are so many different mantles out there and some of them are just total and utter garbage trash heating mantles and like, my across international mantle might not be exactly the same as your across international mantle and like why that is I don't know but the same temperatures don't all like exactly the same temperatures don't always apply exactly the same rotation so you just got to keep slowly increasing your temperature increasing your rotation starting one upper 150s low 160s and slowly get all the way to about uh, 184, 185 Celsius, um, depending the like how is I've definitely seen people like let the whole thing stall out and like because you're 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 losing a lot of heat and there's you're getting reflux, so you have to like keep driving that temperature up at like a good rate. Yeah. So the the trickiest part is how you pre-process determines so much how you're going to run a short path or like that's kind of true on a white film but because you do a strip pass first and then a traditional first pass it kind of like takes all that stuff in in just two nice and even fell swoops and that stuff is gone where they decarb you can like, like short path you can decarb in the pot yes white and that's a horrible, horrible like idea five times through the system to get it decarbed yeah. so i mean it's it's no matter what long term how you look at decarboxylation which is really important to figuring out your temperatures right um you want to ultimately decarb in something that you are not distilling with like that is the best thing you can do just like you have your separate reactor right like for a lot of people that's just simply hey that's industrial scale process I have a big thing doing this and then I have another big thing doing this. But ultimately that decarboxylation stage is so detrimental to your rotary vein oil-based pumps that the more you can not decarb in what you're distilling, the better your machine is gonna run. And I think some of you would be surprised at how little you need to change your pump oil when you're not sending total garbage volatiles through the pump oil. Nice. Um, I think it's about time to wrap up our very first mini cast. All right. Uh, please send us all your questions. We'll try to answer all the good ones. And thank you for joining us. Yeah. Like Alan, it's been happy to be here. Invite me anytime.